Today's video is brought to you by Hunter Killer. Hunter Killer is an incredibly cool subscription box service. Every month they send you a box that is full of clues. It's up to you, your friends, and your family to use the clues to solve a murder. The clues are really high quality and they look like they could have come from the set of a movie or a TV show. A Hunter Killer subscription is an amazing gift for several reasons. The first is that it's a gift that comes throughout the year. With a few snacks and drinks, each box makes for a great night in. Essentially, you'd be giving a night of entertainment each month. It's way better than another night scrolling through Netflix looking for something to watch. Hunter Killer also makes a great gift because you can send it directly to the recipient's home. It's an awesome contactless gift that's perfect for people you can't see this year. Or buy it for yourself and have an unforgettable New Year's Eve murder mystery evening. Check out Hunter Killer yourself by going to huntedkiller.com slash criminally listed and use the promo code criminally listed to get 20% off your first box. Once again, please make sure you use the promo code criminally listed. Do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Number 3. Earl Gibson Denson In early March 1971, Earl Gibson Denson of Colorado Springs, Colorado was 31 years old. He had two sons and a daughter. He had been employed as a mechanic. Unfortunately, in early March 1971, he was going through some tough times. He and his wife had split up. He had lost his job and his car had been repossessed. Things got to be so bad that Denson wanted to end his life. So he asked his son, 8-year-old Earl Eugene Denson, to stab him with a butcher knife. His son refused to do it. Then Denson picked up his gun, a 38 caliber revolver, and stood on his bed. He unscrewed the light bulb from the socket. He cocked the revolver and he handed it to his son. For reasons that were never made clear, Denson stuck one of his fingers into the light socket. He then ordered his eight-year-old son to shoot him. Earl Jr. did as he was told, and he fired a bullet into his 31-year-old father. Denson fell onto the bed. He told his son to keep what just happened a secret. He also said that God would return him to life after three days. He then asked his son for a glass of water. Earl Jr. got his father a glass of water and put a blanket over him. Earl Jr. then went to sleep on a couch. The next morning, the boy's grandmother came into the home. She found her grandson sleeping on the couch and her son dead in the bed. The police took Earl Jr. into protective custody after the body was found. After talking to him, they realized he had no understanding of what he had done. He had only shot his father because his father had told him to do it. So they released the eight-year-old boy into his mother's custody and he was never charged in connection with his father's death. Number 2. Hilma Marie Witt Beverly Shores is a small town in northwest Indiana. It is situated on the banks of Lake Michigan. In 1981, the population of the town was about 850 people. 44-year-old Paul Witt lived in Beverly Shores with his wife of 18 years, Hilma, who went by the name Marie, and their two sons, 15-year-old Eric and 12-year-old John. For 23 years, Paul worked as a millwright. He was also a volunteer firefighter. On the night of September 1st, 1981, one of Paul's sons called 911. Paul had been shot in the head and he was dead. Eric said that his father had been sleeping on the couch, but he wanted to ask him a question about a gun. He claimed that he tripped over a rug 
and the gun accidentally went off. Paul's death was ruled an accident and the case was closed. After Paul's death, Marie, John, and Eric moved in with Paul's stepmother, 71-year-old Elaine Witt. She lived just outside of Michigan City, Indiana. Nearly three years later, in November 1984, Marie, John, and Eric were arrested in California. They were arrested after trying to cash one of Elaine's social security checks. The police investigated the situation and they learned that no one had seen 74-year-old Elaine Witt in 11 months. The police questioned 15-year-old John about the whereabouts of his step-grandmother. John said that on January 4, 1984, Elaine was sleeping in her bed. John, who was 14 at the time, shot Elaine once in the chest with a high-power crossbow. John told the investigators that he killed his step-grandmother because his mother had ordered him to murder her. It turned out that Elaine found out that Marie had been siphoning money from her bank account. Marie had convinced John that if he killed Elaine, their money troubles would be over. They could take the money from her savings account and keep cashing her social security checks. Marie told John that he could either strangle her or shoot her with his crossbow. He was allowed to decide that for himself. Marie was not at home when the murder happened. After Elaine was dead, the family set to work dismembering her body in a closet. They used knives, a circular saw, chisels, and a chainsaw. They put the pieces in a chest freezer. They tried various ways of disposing of the remains, including putting it in a trash compactor and trying to dissolve it with acid. They also used a microwave and a deep fryer. The family spent about four months dismembering and trying to dispose of the body. Eventually, they discarded the body parts throughout Indiana and Illinois. When they moved to California, they brought the freezer with them and threw out the rest of the remains. John also told the police that his father's death was not an accident. He said he knew it wasn't an accident because he had witnessed it. He had watched his brother Eric, who was 15 at the time, shoot their father in the head as he was sleeping on the couch. John explained that the experience with their father's death led them to dispose of Elaine's body. They disposed of Elaine's body because they did not want to endure another police investigation. The police then questioned Eric about his father's death and he confirmed that he intentionally shot his father in the head while he was asleep. Eric said he killed his father because his mother had forced him to do it. Eric said he initially refused to kill his father. His mother, Marie, told him he had to do it or she was going to kill herself. She told him that he could either shoot his father or beat him to death with a hammer. She told Eric they had to do it because he wouldn't get in as much trouble if he got caught because he was a juvenile. Marie told Eric that she was going out and while she was gone, he had to kill his father. While Marie was out, she called Eric and told him she wasn't coming home until he had killed his father. So Eric shot his father in the head while he was sleeping on the couch. The family claims that Paul was killed because he was abusive. It turned out that Marie and her mother, Margaret O'Donnell, had tried to kill Paul in the month before he was shot. They had laced his food with rat poison and Valium. Marie thought that Paul was allergic to Valium. O'Donnell also helped dispose of Elaine's remains and cleaned up the crime scene. None of Elaine's remains have ever been found. Marie, Eric, and John Witt were all charged with murder. 
Marie's mother was charged with attempted murder. For the two murder charges, Marie had two trials, which both happened in the fall of 1998. Her sons and her mother testified against her at the trials. Marie Witt was found guilty on all counts, and she was sentenced to 140 years in prison. She appealed, and her sentence was reduced to 90 years. She is currently incarcerated at the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis. Her earliest possible release date is April 15, 2027. Maria's mother, Margaret O'Donnell, made a plea deal that she was sentenced to six years of prison in March 1986. Marie's sons, Eric and John, were both sentenced to 20 years of prison for their roles in the murders. They were both released in 1996 after serving about 11 years of prison, and they have not had any trouble with the law since being discharged. Number 1. David Brown In March 1985, 32-year-old David Brown lived in Golden Grove, California. Brown owned his own computer business that recovered data from damaged computer systems. His business was successful and he claimed to be a multi-millionaire. In that spring of 1985, his living situation was a bit complicated. He lived with his 23-year-old wife, Linda Marie Brown, and their 8-month-old daughter. David's 14-year-old daughter from a previous marriage, Cinnamon, lived with them as well. Linda's 17-year-old sister, Patty Bailey, lived with them as well. Patty had lived with them for the past five years. When David and Linda met in the late 1970s, Linda was living with her mother and her ten siblings. David lived next door to them and he claimed he had cancer. He asked his neighbor if her daughters could come over and help him do chores and he would pay them. The neighbor readily agreed. Eventually, David and Linda's relationship turned sexual. David later announced that he had been cured of cancer. David and Linda got married in early 1979 when Linda was just 17 years old. The marriage lasted a month and then they got divorced. David married again soon afterward. This was David's fifth wife. But that marriage only lasted a few months and then they filed for divorce. After his divorce, David went back to Linda. Not long afterward, David got married for the sixth time to his fourth wife. In the early morning hours of March 19, 1985, David called 911. Several officers arrived at the family's home minutes later. David was there with his 17-year-old sister-in-law, Patty, and his 8-month-old daughter. In the master bedroom, the police found the dead body of 23-year-old Linda Brown. She had been shot twice with a 38 caliber handgun. The police asked David what happened. David explained that earlier that night, he and Linda had a bit of a spat and he couldn't sleep, so he went out for a drive. He bought some comic books and some snacks at a 24-hour convenience store. He then went to the beach, where he said he sat and did some thinking. He thought he was away from home for about an hour. When he returned home, he found Patty looking nervous and she was holding the baby. She was upset and said that Cinnamon had tried to kill her by shooting at her. David told the police that Cinnamon was a problem child and that she and Linda did not get along. In fact, Cinnamon had been banished from the house and was forced to sleep in a trailer in the yard. David said he had no idea where Cinnamon was. 
He was afraid to check the master bedroom, so he called the police. Police officers started to search the property. In a dog pen in the back, there were two large dog houses. A detective noticed that something was inside one of the dog houses. It turned out to be 14-year-old Cinnamon lying in a pool of her own vomit and urine. Cinnamon crawled out of the doghouse and it was clear she was ill. In her hand was a roll of paper tied with a ribbon. The note was open and it read, Dear God, please forgive me. I didn't mean to hurt her. Cinnamon was taken to the police station in an ambulance. On the way to the hospital, she said she swallowed about 80 pills from three bottles. Cinnamon Brown was interviewed by a detective and she admitted to shooting her stepmother. The detective asked her why she did it and she said it was because Linda didn't like her and wanted to send her away. After a while, Cinnamon became unresponsive and she was taken to the hospital. She was treated and released back into police custody. On the surface, the case seemed straightforward. Simon didn't like her stepmother and feared being sent away, so she killed her. Simon Brown's trial started on August 7, 1985. She pleaded guilty by reason of insanity. Simmons claimed that she could not remember the murder. Simmons' father was supposed to testify against her, but he claimed he was sick and he didn't come to the trial. The trial lasted for five days. Cinnamon, who celebrated her 15th birthday behind bars, was found guilty of first-degree murder. In 1985, 15-year-old Cinnamon was sentenced to 27 years to life. She was sent to a juvenile detention center in Camarillo, California. After Linda's murder, David got a payout of $835,000 from four life insurance policies that he had taken out on Linda's life. Accounting for inflation, that is about $2 million in 2020. Some of the policies were taken out just weeks before Linda was murdered. With the money, David purchased two houses and some new cars. Then, in the summer of 1986, David got married for the seventh time. His sixth wife was 18-year-old Patty Bailey, the sister of his fifth wife, who had been murdered a year earlier by his daughter. However, at David's behest, they kept the marriage a secret. But then, months later, Patty became pregnant and eventually gave birth to a daughter. The deputy district attorney who prosecuted Cinnamon Brown thought that there were major problems with the case. He thought that there were just too many odd things surrounding it. For example, David just happened to be out of the house in the middle of the night when Linda was shot. When he came home, why didn't he check on his wife who might be in dire need of help? Also, Cinnamon didn't have a history of violence. She was meek and mild-mannered and unlike any killer the deputy district attorney had ever come across. The case bothered the deputy district attorney so much they kept tabs on David Brown. He became even more suspicious of David when he found out that he married Patty and that Patty had given birth to his child. In the summer of 1988, about three years in his cinnamon sentence, the deputy district attorney contacted her in jail. Cinnamon immediately started telling a new story. Cinnamon said that her father told her and Patty that Linda and her twin brother were plotting to kill him. 
She said that Paddy and her father discussed plans to get rid of Linda. David told her they had to get rid of Linda or he would have to leave town. Simon told her father that she didn't want him to leave. Then one day, Simon went on a drive with David and Paddy. David asked Simon if he really loved her. Simon said that she did. David said that if she really loved him, that she would trust him. He then asked her if she had the stomach to murder someone. Over the next few weeks, anytime Cinnamon was in the car with her father and step-aunt, they tried to convince her that she needed to kill her stepmother. On the night of the murder, Cinnamon said that her father told her that it had to happen that night. He told Cinnamon that if she really loved him, that she would kill Linda. Cinnamon said that her father made her get the suicide note that she had written days before. He then made her swallow a bunch of pills and then go out to the doghouse. In that initial conversation, Simon claimed that she wasn't in the house when the deadly shots were fired. She said that when she was in the doghouse, she heard three gunshots. The deputy district attorney got another deputy to help him with the case. They arranged for Cinnamon to wear a wire when her father visited her. During David's visit, Cinnamon talked about the murder and David made some incriminating statements that implicated both him and Patty in Linda's murder. The next time David came to visit Cinnamon, Patty came with him. Once again, Cinnamon was wearing a wire. Cinnamon confronted them about their roles in Linda's murder, and Patty and David claimed that they didn't remember much about what happened that night. After her father's second visit, Cinnamon told the deputy district attorneys that she was the one who shot Linda. She also said that her father suggested shooting herself in the head afterward. He told her to shoot herself in a way that it would only nick her head did not cause any serious damage. But Cinnamon refused and David said that the pills would be sufficient. What Cinnamon did not know was that if she had not vomited, the pills probably would have killed her. The deputy district attorneys were sure that David wanted Cinnamon to die to tie up any loose ends. Cinnamon said that Patty gave her the gun and told her she just had to pull the trigger. Cinnamon went into the master bedroom and shot Linda once. She left the room, but she could hear Linda moaning. Cinnamon went back into the bedroom and shot her again. Then she went into Patty's room and shot a hole in the wall to make it look like she shot at Patty. Cinnamon then went out to the doghouse and passed out for several hours. In October 1988, both David and Patty were arrested for the murder of Linda Brown. Patty cooperated with the deputy district attorneys. She told them that not long after moving in with her sister and David, she and David got involved in a sexual relationship. She was just 11 years old at the time. Starting sometime in 1984, Patty said that David tried to get her to murder her sister. Patty said that six months before Linda was killed, David sent her into the bedroom where Linda was sleeping with a handgun. But Patty couldn't go through with it. Patty also said that David came up with several scenarios as to how they could kill Linda and make it look like an accidental shooting. Patty then verified that Cinnamon's confession was accurate. Patty was asked why she wanted her sister dead. Patty said that David instilled in them that the family was the most important thing and Linda was the enemy because she was trying to destroy the family. Patty compared it to being in a cult. 
in jail awaiting trial, David developed a plan with a fellow inmate to murder the two deputy district attorneys who were prosecuting his case and Patty. The inmate went directly to the deputy district attorneys and cooperated with them. The inmate was transferred to a different jail. But David was told he was released. The inmate was then brought back to the jail where David was being held and they met in the visitor's area. He wore a wire and recorded David planning out the murders. After the meeting, the inmate would call David and their conversations were recorded. On the phone calls, David said that the deputy district attorneys were to be shot. Since Patty was in jail, David wanted the inmate's girlfriend to get arrested and then kill Patty in jail. David was subsequently charged with three counts of conspiracy to commit murder, amongst other charges. The inmate who helped catch David did not get anything in return for his cooperation. He had gone to the deputy district attorneys because David Brown disgusted him. Patty Bailey pleaded guilty to murder. She was sentenced to the custody of the California Youth Authority until the age of 25. David Brown went to trial at the end of April 1990. Both Patty and Cinnamon testified against him. The recordings of him plotting the murders of Patty and the two district attorneys were also played in court. In June 1990, David Brown was found guilty on all counts. At David's sentencing hearing, the judge called him a scary person. The judge said that he was even afraid of him. He said to David, you make Charlie Manson look like a piker. According to Merriam-Webster, a piker is one who does things in small ways. David Brown was ultimately sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Simon Brown was paroled in February 1992 at the age of 21 after serving nearly eight years. She went on to lead a normal life and she did not have any further trouble with the law. When Patty Bailey was convicted, she was 21 years old and she was released when she was 25. Upon release, Patty married a correctional officer who worked at the prison. David Brown died of natural causes in March 2014 at the age of 61. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Recently, we launched a podcast called Into the Killing. In each episode, we examine a cold case that was solved years later. In our latest episode, we take a look at the haunting murder of a young girl and a tragic miscarriage of justice. Into the Killing is available on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.